the wheat and the tares. Wheat and the tares. Amen. Did you know that it's possible to believe in Jesus and not be saved? It's, a, it's possible to believe in God and Jesus is God and not be saved. You know, some will start off believing and they will not last. We spoke about the parable of the sower and I'm not going to go back into the parable of the sower, but the parable of the sower is found in Matthew chapter 13. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 13. It talks about in Matthew chapter 13, verse 19. The wicked one comes and catches away that which was sown in his heart. And this is he which receives seed by the wayside. So we see with that verse that the enemy who is the devil can come and steal the word out of a person's heart when they receive it. So that's why it's important to know some of the elements of spiritual warfare of how at least how to plead the blood of Jesus over your mind when you're sitting up under the word. Even when you're at home, you're listening to the word, you can plead the blood of Jesus over your mind, over your heart. So that the devil will not be able to steal the word of God. You can say you cannot steal this word out of my heart in Jesus name. Then it talks about in verse 20, it said they receive the seed into stony places. He hears the word and anon with joy they receive it. So it sounds like a good word. They bear witness with that word. It's a good word to them. And it really touched their hearts. But it says in verse 21, it says, yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, by and by, he is offended. So when people get offended, they turn away. They get offended Sometimes it's against God. Sometimes it's against others. So when people are offended, they're in their own little box and God can't reach them. So we have to learn how to get away from offense. We have to give it to the Lord. We can't filter the word of God through our offense. We get offended. Jesus said we it's impossible for us to avoid offense. It's impossible for us to avoid it. But that's why forgiveness is there. That's why the love of God is there. Verse 22. He also that receiveth seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, word and he becometh unfruitful. And then it says in verse 23, it talks about receiving the seed into the good ground. That's where we want to receive the seed into the good ground. That's the ground that's been prepared by forgiving your enemies, by repentance. By asking the Lord, hey, Lord, what about me? Is there anything in me that you want to get rid of? Is something inside of me stopping your word from coming forth and bringing forth fruit? I'm blaming everybody else, but is there something in me? That's one thing that people offended. They do. They blame others. They look on the outside and blame others. But sometimes it's something inside of me that God wants to do. Praise the Lord. So some may start off believing, but it will not last. 
Maybe because of holding on to the old sin ways, maybe because of the parable of the sower. There's things that happen in the spirit realm. So it's good to be in a ministry that you can pray for, that you can stay in and, and grow with. Don't get mad at the pastor one night or one day and leave the church because you got mad at that pastor or you got mad at somebody in your congregation or the congregation didn't do what you thought they should do or the pastor didn't say what you thought the pastor should say you get mad and say i'm not going back to that church anymore without even asking god about it it can't be about self all the time before we got saved it was about us it was all about me but when we get saved and when we come to Jesus Christ, we've got to learn how to let him have part of our life, have all of our life day by day. We may have grown up in families that always feuded, that never could forgive one another, that always cuss one another out. And that is the environment that we're used to being in. But when we come to the Lord, God wants to change all of that. He wants to give us a new life, a new beginning. You know, we believe in the deliverance ministry and the casting out of evil spirits. But I tell you, that is not the whole ball of wax. It can be sometimes a sensation type ministry. It can be where the devil seems to have more power than Jesus if the deliverance minister allows it. What I'm trying to say is deliverance is not the ticket if the person does not plan to live for Jesus. If the person has in themselves any kind of inkling that they're not wanting to desperately get rid of what's bothering them in their lives, what's keeping them from serving Jesus fully, then the deliverance ministry, it can be more of a hindrance than a help. It is not the end all be all. Our salvation is our salvation. It's not my wife's salvation. It's not my children's salvation. It's not anybody else's salvation. I invited Jesus into my life. I asked Jesus to come and live in my heart. So somebody shouldn't have to look over me to make sure I'm serving Jesus. Somebody shouldn't have to watch and see what I'm doing to tell me, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be doing this. You see, Jesus said it's good for you. He told the disciples it's good for you that I go away because I'm going to send the comforter. And the comforter is the Holy Spirit. And he said he will guide you into all truth. So when we're trying to be, if I'm trying to be my wife's Holy Ghost, if I'm trying to look and see what she's doing and say, hey, baby, you know, Jesus doesn't want you to be doing that. I'm in the wrong. Because faith in God will cause us to keep our mouth shut when we do want to talk. Sometimes God wants to grow our faith. When we have faith in our own intellect, we have faith in our talents, we have faith in our abilities, but God wants to grow us in his faith. The faith to be able to love the unlovable, the, the faith to be able to forgive the unforgivable, forgive somebody that took a knife right in my back. God wants me to be able to forgive him. He doesn't want me to walk around offended. He doesn't want me to walk around building walls around myself. He wants me to have his love and it's a growth it's a growth process it's something that starts off with the word of god and being sincere being sincere so it is possible to believe and yet not be saved john 2 23 to 25 says when he was in jerusalem and at the passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when? 
when they saw the miracles which he did. Some people will only believe if they see a, if they see something visible. But Jesus said in John chapter six, I'm not going there. He told the people that saw the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes. Jesus had to get away from them because they were trying to make him a king. But then they found him and Jesus rebuked them. He said, you come to me because of the loaf and the fishes and are filled. But he told them later on, he said, I am the bread of life. And the Bible says that when he was telling them about that, he was the bread of life. Later on down in John chapter six, it said some left him because it was hard to hear. They said it's a hard thing. And the Bible says many left him and followed him no more. And he turned to the disciples and he said, would you leave me also? And Peter spoke up and said, Lord, we can't leave you because you have the words to eternal life. You see, it's not easy to be a Christian. But I can tell you, if you walked on that other side and you walked with the devil and been tormented and been where you could not see the light of day, I'm not saying you won't be like that as a Christian. There might be some dark days. There might be some windy seas to arise. But when you build your foundation on the rock, the Bible says there were two foundations that can, can be built. There's a foundation on the rock, and then there's the foundation on the sand. So when the winds and the waves come and the foundation is on the rock, your house has a better chance. But if it's on the sinking sand, we got people praying for us. Amen. Amen. We always got somebody praying for us. That's why we are a body. We can kind of look out for one another. We can kind of look out without judgment, without condemnation. And we can pray, at least pray in our prayer languages. Pray in the spirit. If you haven't used it in a, long, in a while, time to pick it back up. Hallelujah. But the Bible said many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Verse 24 in John chapter 2 it said, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them. He didn't commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man. For he knew what was in man. God knows what's in us. We can say something with our mouths. We can show a good testimony when we're in the visible, when somebody's looking at us. But the real test comes is what's in your heart. It's one thing to believe in Jesus, but another thing to commit your heart to him. It's hard sometimes to let go of those old ways. Sometimes those old ways, those things we call generational curses, those things from the generational lines that your grandfather did, your, your daddy did, your great grandfather did. They will try to come down the family line and enforce themselves on you and make you live in those same patterns. But Jesus, the Bible said, curse is he that hangeth upon the tree, that the blessings of Abraham might fall upon the Gentile through Jesus Christ. So those scriptures said that the Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knows what's in our hearts. He knows why we are serving him. If we're serving him for something that's personal, something that we can get out of him, something because we're blessed because of this. We're blessed because of material things. What would it take you? I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask those out there listening today. What would it take for me to give up on God? What would it take? What would it take for me to give up on God? Do we know our own hearts? 
Jesus knew that some would-be followers had superficial faith. Follow him just because he is doing something for them. Because of, of the blessings. A sunshiny day, I call it a sunshiny day belief. As long as the sun's shining and everything's going good, we love Jesus. I love you, Jesus. You are my God. But as soon as something goes bad in our life and the dark times come, I talked last week, there's nothing wrong with questioning God. Because in the Psalms, we gave some scriptures about it. But the thing that is wrong that God doesn't want us to do is turn our backs on him. And walk away from him. Because if we look in that rearview mirror long enough. You know if you're driving. And you keep looking in that rearview mirror. You're going to miss a pedestrian that's walking right in front of you. And there's going to be a sudden accident. Something that you cannot reverse. What I'm trying to say if you're looking in the past. You're looking at what happened. You're looking at things in the past that God that happen to you and you take them on board and you're never a able to get them out of your heart and everything that comes into your heart that comes into your mind is going to be filtered by those past hurts until we let go until we let God we will we can't be all that God wants us to be he wants us to be so much Jeremiah 17 9 says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it sometimes we may not even know our own hearts that's what this scripture is talking about we may have things in there that we've lived with for so long we have things that we live with so long every day. They become a part of our heart. They become a part of our mind. They become a part of who we are. God can't get through until we submit ourselves to him, till we forgive that past hurt, till we forgive that past thing that is on that monkey on our back. We're living with it. Verse 10 in Jeremiah 17, I, the Lord, searched the heart. I tried the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. We were born with hearts inclined towards sin. We were products, like I just said, of our environment. God wants to change us. The word of God is what changes us, not coming to church. That's part of it. That's good. We want you to be here. But unless we take that word and apply it to our lives and be doers of the word and not hearers only. We may have been Christians for 30 years. We may have been Christians for 25 years. We may have been Christian for 40 years and still be bitter and unforgiven when we think about certain things. When we think about what how our daddy might have treated us, when we think about how our mama might have treated us, what our sisters and brothers did to us, what our teacher in third grade, fourth grade did to us. The devil will always flash things on, on our minds to keep us bound in offense. He will keep us bound in unforgiveness. He will keep us bound where we cannot escape. He is the master of setting traps like that. He wants us to fall into the trap of unforgiveness and bitterness. It's a trap. Because we can't be all that God wants us to be. He was a loving God. Father, the Bible says he sent his own son so that we wouldn't have to suffer. And it was an act of love. It was an act of love. And he wants that same kind of love in our hearts. 
He don't want us to love people that's going to love us. There's a love called filial love. When we love people that love us. When we're good to people that are good to us. But then there's love called agape love. When we can love people unconditionally. When they don't love us back. That's a hard thing. It's hard, yes, to forgive somebody that you know that did you wrong. But sometimes we think people have done us wrong, but we may not know the whole story. Our goal is to have agape love. Can we get there? But it's not for us to decide who is saved and who is not saved. It's not for us to walk around and on our high horses and say they're not saved. He's not saved. She's not saved. And then leave it at that. Don't even pray for them. Don't even go up and try to lead them to Jesus. But just say they're not saved. God wants to give us eyes to see and ears to hear his eyes. I want the eyes of Jesus. I need the ears of Jesus. Jesus said in John 12, 48, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. We already have a judge. The judge is the words of Jesus Christ. He said, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge in the last day. Jesus Christ is the great judge. His word will judge. It is he that gives us the eyes to see and ears to hear, not to, so we can look super spiritual, so that he can develop our prayer lives, so he can develop the love of God in us. That's why he might show us something. If he's showing us something so that we can just leave it at that, then it might not be Jesus that's showing it to you. Because in the supernatural realm, you have Jesus Christ and you also have Satan. And he gives people demonic eyes to see. Yes, Jesus knows the heart of humanity. Not everyone that is in the body of Christ is a true believer. We got to know that. Everyone that's in the body of Christ is not a true believer. So if God shows us something about somebody in the body of Christ, he shows us something in the spirit. He gives us a dream about it. He shows us. We got to ask him why we got to ask him what he wants us to do about it. It's not to go just to anybody and say, God showed me a dream about such and such person. God showed me a dream about them. God showed me they're gossiping behind the pastor's back. That's not the proper way to handle what God shows you. Because we don't know who we're talking to. We don't know their spiritual condition. We don't know that we can trust the, who we're talking to. So we might be the catalyst of slander and gossip and lies to be spread about somebody because the lie in the wrong lips ends up as a bigger lie and it ends up way out of proportion something that it wasn't intended to be not everyone in in the body of christ is a true believer the enemy plants counterfeits amongst the real and jesus talks about it in Matthew chapter 13, we were there in Matthew chapter 13. And in verse 24, he starts talking about the parable of the tares. He says, another parable put he forth unto them. He followed up the parable of the sower with the parable 
of the tares. So in Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 through 30, I'm, I'm going to uh, go through this rather quickly. I ask that you study it and let the Holy Spirit illuminate it a little bit more for you. Uh, verse 24, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Verse 25, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Verse 26, but when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So we see in verse 24 through 26 that Jesus sows the good seed. This is Jesus that's saying this, that's telling this parable here. Jesus Christ sows the good seed. Wheat depicts true believers and the tares were ones that were professors, but not possessors. Uh, an example of tares could be false brethren, could be false prophets, false teachers. They are tares. But they grow right alongside with the wheat. In Isaiah 29, 13, he says, Wherefore the Lord says, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by their precept of men. That is the professor Somebody that can profess Jesus Christ, but not have the fruit of Jesus Christ in their lives. When you look deep into their lives. Matthew 15, 8. This people draweth not unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. The tear is is a little bit about the tear. The tear is found in grain fields and is a poisonous grass that almost looks like wheat. But in harvest time, tares can be recognized and separated easily. And one day God is going to separate the wheat from the tares. It shows it in his second coming. He separates the wheat from the tares. Now back in Matthew uh, 13 verse 25 Jesus said, but while men slept, the Bible talks about, I'm going to stop there just for a second. The Bible talks about a spiritual sleep a person can be under. They can have their eyes wide awake, but not be able to comprehend or see something spiritually. So God wants us awake and alert in the body of Christ. He wants his believers, his people that profess his name to be able to divide in the spirit realm. We call it discerning in the spirit realm. What is and what isn't? We must know because some speak good words and they speak words that sound just like the word of God is supposed to be. We know that the enemy is Satan in verse 25. He is the master counterfeiter and a deceiver and sows counterfeit wheat amongst the real wheat. There's sometimes we call them infiltrators. Second Corinthians eleven fourteen says, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So if we don't have, that's why we ask the Lord when we first become Christians, God, let me see what I need to see. I don't need to see everything in the spirit realm because I don't want to go crazy. I just want to see what I need to see. And I want to hear what I need to hear to keep me on the straight and narrow. Because Jesus, you said straight is the way that leads to eternal life. And broad is the road that leads to the destruction. So he can appear as a real angel. 
Satan can appear as a real angel. He can appear in a light, a glorious kind of a, like a glorious form. He can appear at the end of your bed or in your hallway, in your home. And he may appear like a angel. But the Bible talks about testing the spirits to see if they be of God. So we can't bind God. So that's why we say, I bind you in the name of Jesus. So if it's not God, then it will go away. We can't bind God. So he can appear as a real angel, but also appears in his fallen form. He can appear in his fallen form and he can appear in a glorious form. Satan has counterfeits. He has counterfeit Christians in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty six, because Paul said in peril among false brethren. He has a counterfeit gospel in Galatians chapter one, verses six through nine. He has counterfeit righteousness in Romans chapter 10, verses one through three. He has a counterfeit church. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, he will produce a counterfeit Christ in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. So back in Matthew chapter 13, verse 26, it says, but when the blade brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. That's why it's important that we seek God to develop the fruit of his fruit in our lives, because Jesus said in uh, Matthew 7, 16, ye shall know them by their fruit. Let's talk about some good fruit real quick. Good fruit are love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control wouldn't we love to just every day exhibit those things in our lives wouldn't it be a blessing that we could walk around in our homes and, and show those things right behind closed doors god means for us to be that way because he said it's the fruit of his spirit let's talk about sin's fruit just for a minute some of sin's fruit the fruit of sins are revenge, unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, resentment, gossip, lies, and slander. That's sin's fruit. Matthew chapter 13, verses 27 through 30. Jesus said, don't root up the tares. That's his job. It's not our job to root up the tares. Because the Bible shows that some of the wheat will be pulled up with the tares if we do it. Verse 27, so the servants of the householder came and said unto him, sir, didst thou not sow good seed in the field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, an enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? In verse 29, he said, nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Verse 30, let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, the reapers of the angels, gather ye together first the tares and bind them into bundles to burn them but gather wheat into my barn. In the Gospels, Jesus calls it his holy barn. He says, I will gather the wheat into my holy barn. If you want to see an explanation of the parable of the wheat and the tares, it is explained in Matthew chapter 13, verses 37 through 42. Is it where Jesus separates the righteous from the wicked? Jesus knows what to do. He knows his job. He wants us to know where we fit into the kingdom. We are not Jesus Christ himself. We are not the Holy Ghost. We are not the Father. We are followers. 
So we just need to make sure that we are in the faith. We need to make sure that we are examining ourselves. I need to make sure that I'm conducting self-examination. Question, are you a wheat uh, or are you a tear? Out there in radio land, are you a wheat or are you a tear? Second Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. First Corinthians eleven twenty eight, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup the the pharisees that's one thing they could not do they were too busy examining jesus to examine themselves they were full of religion they knew how to stand up in their robes of righteousness they knew how to pray in public they knew how to look like they knew what they were talking about but Jesus said, you break the very laws that you're talking about. And he called them that their leaven was hypocrisy. That's what he told them. So Christianity is more than religion and looking holy and looking like we are of the faith. No, we still need the blood of Jesus. We still need repentance in our hearts and in our lives. But Jesus abolished sin. But he said in 1 John, if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father who is Jesus Christ. Self-examination. May we search our own hearts and see if we belong to the master, Jesus Christ. God bless you.